Um, nice to see so many people here. Thank you. Thanks, Nedab, for inviting me, uh, uh, me here. So this, this talk is, is called Agilizing the Architecture uh, Department. And it's basically it is a, a report of some work that we did at, uh, at one of our customers. I work for CGI. CGI is a company, is a large IT services company, um, uh, 70,000 people worldwide. You may know us better as Logica or the older ones of you, although the average age here is not that high, <laughs> may remember CMG, which was the name of the company before that. Um, just to uh, finish my introduction that, uh, that Wout started, um, you see here that uh, some of my hobbies. And um, my main job at CGI in the Netherlands is to, uh, for the last 10 years or so, has been to review architectures. Um, basically, one of the things that IT services companies like CGI do is they, um, uh, they try to win uh, projects, uh, usually uh, in the IT uh, solution uh, uh, atmosphere or, or domain, and these uh, projects, um, they can get very complicated. They, uh, they can get very big, big solutions. And we, uh, we have a process uh, which we have uh, sort of fine-tuned by trial and error that, uh, you know, we have teams working on these solutions. And uh, just before we actually commit to delivering these solutions or to, uh, to put a price tag on them, um, we know that the team has, uh, has, has worked on this solution and they have, by necessity, get gotten into some kind of a, a, a tunnel vision. They need to just look forward positively at the solution and develop it so that it can be, can be offered. And that, of course, has a risk because tunnel vision uh, means that you sort of ignore signals that distract you from your goal. Um, and uh, to mitigate that risk, we have a process where these bits get reviewed, these solutions get reviewed just before we commit to them. And it's been my job to set, that, to set up that process in, in CGI in the Netherlands, and uh, I've been doing this, uh, these reviews for, uh, for years now, uh, apart from also from time to time being an architect on a real project. And the, the, the nice thing about this job, actually it's one of the best jobs in the company, because you get to see all these types of solutions, whether they are for governments, whether they are for the big uh, uh, companies like Philips, or for, 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 you know, in all of these, the, these uh, industry sectors, we make these solutions. You get to see a lot of teams, a lot of people, a lot of great architects and uh, uh, people working on these solutions. You also, see, uh, after a while, you start to see patterns. Uh, patterns, you know, what works well? Which teams are more successful than others? which things actually work uh, again and again, and which things actually we should try to avoid doing in the future. And these patterns, um, uh, I started to write those down, and these developed into an architecture approach, a very pragmatic architecture approach. Of course, we already have uh, a huge architecture uh, approaches and, 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 and processes like TOGAF's ADM, Architecture Development Methods, Etc. But we noticed that in, the pr in our architecture process, we could not use those. We needed actually the, the width of domain of these, uh, uh, of these enterprise architecture approaches because our solutions were just more than just software. So just a software architecture approach was not enough for us. So we needed a uh, an, uh, solution architecture approach that would encompass the business process side of it, the infrastructure side of it, etc., etc. Um, and we couldn't find it, so we started develop developing it by actually uh, writing down our own experiences and comparing those to the things we found in literature. And uh, that's actually developed into our architecture approach, which we call risk and cost-driven architecture. And this talk is about uh, our experiences implementing this risk and cost-driven architecture approach at ProRail, which uh, uh, all of the Dutch people of you probably know as uh, uh, the company that uh, manages the railroad uh, infrastructure in the Netherlands. So, uh, why do we call it risk and cost-driven architecture? Why do we not call it value-driven architecture or something like that that's more, more positive? Well, it's a bit of a teaser. Uh, we discovered that risk and cost actually, once you have uh, a scope for a solution that you need to offer, like you, for example, you, the scope is given to you by a customer, then actually the architect that focuses too much on adding value is very quickly uh, uh, accused of uh, 
uh, gold plating the solution, making it more beautiful than it needs to be. And uh, we discovered that the architects actually got more, more focused and more down to earth if they focused actually on those uh, architectural concerns that uh, had the most impact in terms of risk and cost. And that's what this approach uh, name uh, comes, comes from. Another thing we noticed, uh, almost by accident, is that this uh, approach actually worked not just in traditional waterfall-like projects, but also in agile projects. And the reason is that a bit process, where you actually have uh, just a few weeks to create a complex solution architecture, it uh, needs to be done iteratively, and you need to prioritize, be, be able to prioritize uh, very well. And this is actually the things that you need in an agile uh, development process as well. So it turned out that it worked very well for that as well. Um, so we developed this approach. We started to publish uh, some papers about it. And uh, actually, I even got a PhD thesis out of this whole thing, personally. So that was a nice uh, side effect for me as well. And by now, we have, uh, it's become a spectacular success. We have 400 architects uh, trained in it. Uh, we do it uh, not just within the company, although it was originally developed for internal use, but also uh, at customers. And um, so, so much for the sales uh, <laughs> part of this. Um, let's get it down into the content, because we are all content people, right? We are not sales people or managers. So. Uh, we don't like managers, do we? Actually, that's what some of us were one of the things that was mentioned at the table during dinner uh, just now. <laughs> okay, so the principles of agile architecting that we got out of our CDA are, first of all, that architecture should not be looked at as a big upfront modeling process, but architecture should be looked at as a decision-making process. Architects are those people who actually make the most difficult technical decisions, or the most important technical decisions. Um, Sometimes decisions that are not important are still diff difficult. So uh, it's, it's about important. But how do, you, how do you determine how important a technical decision is? Well, here is uh, where the risk and cost factor in come in, and that's let the economic impact determine your focus. So that has another interesting side effect. It forces architects, even though they are inside techies, it forces them to think in economic terms, to think in terms of risk and cost. And that actually teaches them to to talk the language of the, of the, the, the business uh, managers. And uh, that actually also helps to create better solutions, at least uh, solutions that better fit the, uh, uh, the business. Um, so keeping a backlog of architectural concerns, uh, that those are the decisions that you have to make, uh, prioritizing them by, uh, by risk and cost impact, and then uh, create an architecture that is as small as possible. Because, and this is a principle that actually many architects don't like, because of course, the bigger the things you make, the more important you are, right? So, uh, it's, some architects sort of resist this principle, but it's actually the case that architecture can be, uh, uh, can be bad news. Too much architecture uh, is harmful. Uh, every architectural decision that you make that is not needed is actually uh, unnecessarily constraining Everybody downstream from you, all the developers are actually constrained by these architectural decisions that you make. So if you make them, you better be sure that they are actually important enough, uh, representing enough risk or cost that it actually that you have to make them. And then use just enough anticipation. Architecture is about anticipation. Um, and this is why also there is a little bit of a, uh, uh, let's say, a, a struggle between architecture and agile sometimes, because agile, one of the uh, uh, solutions that the agile world has to uh, uh, an ever-changing environment is actually not to anticipate too much, because the world will change anyway. And architecture is all about anticipation. Uh, but if you, uh, uh, if you do too much of it, uh, then you anticipate too much. Uh, so you, you create a heavy architecture that will just constrain uh, the development team too much. So what is just enough anticipation? And that's one of the things that we're going to go into. So this is a, a report, actually, of uh, how, we, uh, how we helped ProRail to, uh, uh, to use these principles and to make their architects uh, more agile. Now, ProRail, um, I guess, uh, as I said earlier, uh, most of you will know who they are. 
uh, mostly when, from when things go wrong, uh, they get mentioned in the news, <laughs> when the, you know, trains don't run or uh, stuff like that. Uh, but they are actually the people who don't run the trains themselves, but are responsible for keeping all the rails and all the infrastructure that the trains run on uh, up and running. And they have an incredibly uh, uh, complex and highly business critical landscape of all kinds of solutions that are needed to, uh, to do that. And their architecture department, uh, when I first uh, came to talk to them about this a few years back, formally worked like this. Um, they had an architecture department and then they had solution delivery teams. Oops, sorry. And um, the architecture department uh, gave, at the, at the start of a solution delivery project, <laughs> gave architecture guidance. And then um, the solution delivery would start, and then the architecture department would sort of do other things in the meantime. And then uh, at certain points in the solution delivery uh, life cycle, the architects would come back and check whether they were still doing, doing uh, the architecture in the right way, right? And uh, so they were basically uh, responsible, the architecture department, for setting, setting a framework, setting uh, constraints around what the s how the solution could be developed, and actually helping me also with the, with the, with the first iteration of the architecture. Now, agile teams don't like this, and this did not work as soon as the people in ProRail started, the IT department started to, cr to develop software in a more agile wa uh, way. This system started to break down. And uh, when I started to talk to them a few years back, uh, they were al already not really doing this. They were still formally doing this, but in reality, they had already started to do all kinds of other things to actually make it work again. Uh, why doesn't it work? Well, because the agile uh, uh, coaches and uh, the agile teams, they, they don't like this. They, they call this Bavdi. Bavdi is a, uh, is a swear word in, in agileese. It uh, means big upfront design, and it's something that you shouldn't do. And this, they would say, mind your own business. Uh, you know, we, we are a self-organizing team. The best architectures and requirements emerge from the self-organizing team. So what, are, what is your business checking up on me, right? So they needed to change this, uh, uh, this system. Now, we did a lot about that, and I can just say a few of the, uh, the key things that we, uh, uh, that we did. Well, we first started to, to train uh, uh, the architects and, uh, uh, and m many designers and functional business analysts, etc. Everybody who actually was involved in making decisions about the structure of the solutions that they needed. And uh, we, we gave 50 architects a three-day course. And the main thing there was actually uh, teaching the architects to own architectural decisions. And this was something new for them. They always thought that the managers were the people making the decisions. Now, of course, formally, an architect never has the power to make these big decisions that, okay, let's buy Oracle or let's you know, do something like that. But th this is not about making uh, of, or having formally having, uh, having the, the, the power to make these decisions. It's about actually owning them, me meaning feeling responsible for, um, uh, for shepherding the decision process and making sure that the right decisions are made. And then uh, we started uh, to coach architects um, and uh, uh, we focused on a, a few of the RCDA uh, practices that were, uh, uh, that were most important for that. And actually, uh, the following slides are about those, uh, those practices. This is actually the, the picture that summarizes the architecture process or the architecture practice of making decisions. And it's very simple. Actually, it's the same picture for every, every role that makes decisions. And there's nothing special about architects here, except that actually the, the decisions are called architectural decisions, and the uh, things that you have to decide about are, are called architectural concerns. And here you see the use of a backlog. So you ident identify and prioritize these concerns, that the things that you have to decide about, and then you have a backlog. Now, why are backlogs so, so popular in, because we know a product backlog, right, from, uh, from the Agile, uh, from Scrum, for example. Uh, why are they so popular in Agile uh, methodologies? Because a backlog allows you to, um, to reprioritize uh, quickly if, if something happens, something changes. So a backlog, any backlog system will make it uh, uh, easier to deal with change than a, uh, a, a system that actually plans ahead many, many steps. 
And then the architect just researches the solutions and he decides or helps uh, shepherds the decision process into architectural decisions. Um, so this is basically what we taught them. And for, for many architects, uh, practicing architects, as I said, this was an eye-opener uh, because they never thought about architecture in terms of decisions, but always in terms of modeling and making pictures. So how does that decision process work in, uh, in the Scrum process? Well, in the Scrum, this, this is a picture that everybody knows. I think it's one of the first pictures you always get projected when you learn how to work uh, in the Scrum world. You have a backlog, a product backlog, I call it a solution backlog. And then out of that backlog, you select some of the improvements that you can actually make in a sprint. And then you start to, uh, to, to realize them. And uh, you do that with uh, daily meetings, daily uh, reflection to actually check whether you're still doing the right thing. And uh, that will end up in a solution increment. Uh, how does the, this architecture process uh, or we call it the architecture microcycle, fit in there? Well, it's actually quite simple. We just put next to this the architectural concern backlog, uh, which then, uh, by identifying, prioritizing, and making decisions, actually produces a backlog of, of or a, uh, a list of architectural decisions. And these decisions, in turn, lead to components that need to be implemented, or stories. Now, these may not be user stories, because sometimes, these architectural decisions, or actually most of the time, they are about things that you are not that are not directly visible to the end user. They are things under the hood, and this can be things like removing a piece of technical debt, or actually uh, introducing a new piece of structure that is needed for to to to, uh, to uh, realize a non-functional requirement. For example, if you want to improve response time. Uh, you may need to uh, uh, in in introduce an architectural component called a cache, right? And the caching mechanism does nothing to improve the functionality. Actually, it may, degrade it, it may actually harm the functionality a little bit, but it does nothing to improve it. It just improves the response time. But it's not visible to the outside world, so it's under the hood. So, um, and you see these little colors. I will explain those as well. Those colors were invented by uh, Philip Kruchten, one of my... My, my heroes in this field. And uh, they can will actually help you reason about uh, these architectural uh, uh, elements, or actually the, the backlog ele uh, elements, uh, because they're actually different kinds of them. So just enough anticipation. I mentioned this term before. How do you determine what is just enough anticipation? Uh, and this is actually kind of a a hard one, uh, the, the uh, Scaled Agile Framework, uh, which, uh, who of you knows the Scaled Agile Framework, or SAFE, called sometimes? Oh, not too many. Okay, well, the Scaled Agile Framework is, is currently quite popular. It's, uh, it's about how you can scale up a Scrum-like process and use multiple teams working in parallel, and how you comb can combine that with uh, reasoning about architecture. And they actually have a metaphor for, uh, for anticipation for anticipating architecture. It's called the architecture runway. And this metaphor I like actually uh, quite a bit because it's uh, basically it's, it, it compares the architecture of a system or of a piece of software or another solution to a runway that you need to be able to accommodate planes. The planes that are going to land on that runway are the features, the user stories. Now, if all of your user stories are little Cessna planes, you know, you can probably do with a, a runway that is, uh, I know, 200 meters long and uh, not so wide, and maybe doesn't even have to be concrete. It may, uh, may be grass. And uh, but as soon as uh, you uh, you know that uh, six months from now we are going to have a, a a private jet coming in, then you know, oh, oh dear, I have to anticipate that. I actually have to start lengthening my runway, and I may actually have to change the grass into uh, a concrete. And that is uh, architectural anticipation. It's basically those user stories that have a, a big architectural impact. If you can anticipate those, uh, then you, st you can start working uh, on your architecture components in time to accommodate those, uh, those requirements. Now, of course, sometimes what happens is that you suddenly, somebody tells you, you know, we have this jumbo jet coming in uh, two weeks from now. <laughs> No way can we actually build a concrete runway uh, that we need for to, to accommodate a jumbo jet in two weeks. 
But we can do something quick and dirty. We can cut some trees there and we can lay out some, you know, like the army does sometimes, we can lay out some stuff. Temporary, and then the jumbo jet can land, and then if more come, then uh, we, will, we will fix it. We will make it into concrete. And if, uh, if that was the only jumbo jet, we will just break it down again. Now, of course, this also happens all the time in, in software development. Uh, and the, this is called refactoring, right? You have this temporary solution and then uh, you know that you're going to need it for a, for a longer time. You actually have some technical debt that you need to resolve. The temporary solution is, is technical debt and the refactoring then actually repays the technical debt. So there's a very nice paper by uh, three people from the, uh, the Software Engineering Institute, Rod Nord, Nanette Brown and uh, Ipek Oskaya. And they basically say that you need three things to be able to do this. This trick of just enough anticipation requires three tools. One of them is dependency analysis, because you know which elements depend on, on other, other elements, and so that you can determine in what order they need to be, uh, to, be, to be made. The second one is technical debt control, which I just explained. It's about making sure that you don't leave you know, the, uh, the temporary solution in place and thus make it harder for everyone after you to, uh, uh, to, to modify the system. And the third one is economic trade-off, which actually is one of these principles that I just talked to, to you about. And they uh, are mentioning some tools here that I don't have time to go into uh, now that, you can, uh, that can actually help you to reason about the different scenarios uh, that you can use to, uh, uh, to anticipate about the architecture. I promised you this uh, explanation of these colors of solution increments um, invented by Philip Kruchten. Basically, he divides it into four cells. You have uh, visible and invisible improvements, and the visible improvements can be positive, which means new features, user story, use cases, uh, added functionality, or with negative value, they are the defects, they are in your, your bug repository. But then there's the under the hood improvements, and those can also be positive, like adding a new, nice new structural feature that strengthens your solution or improves a, a non-functional requirement. Or they can be negative, actually reducing the value of your solution, and that's what we call technical debt. And this is, this is a very nice definition of, uh, of technical debt. And if in your agile process, in your scrum process, you make sure that you have the right balance between all of these, then um, you're actually doing just enough architecture in your agile uh, process. Of course, that requires that both the, let's say, the dogmatic architect, the dogmatic architect won't accept this because he will want to make sure that everything is addressed before actually we start, like Rod said. It also does not work with the dogmatic agilist because the dogmatic agilist will say, uh, or will tell their, project, pr their product owner that uh, uh, only the green stuff gets in because we prioritize by only one thing and that is, uh, and that is business value, user value, and user value. So it requires some, uh, let's say, some less dogmatic thinking to be able to, to do this. But if you are able to do that, actually it works quite well, is our experience. And then you can start anticipating, sprint planning, etc. And uh, this is another thing that we taught the architects at, uh, at ProRail was to actually include time as a, as a first class d uh, entity in their architecture work. Architecture is not just about creating the right structure, it's also about reasoning about the order in which you do that, especially if you're working agile. If you're an agile architect, you're not an upfront architect. So actually, it's l then you say that architecture is, uh, doesn't stop at the, at when the design is finished. No, architecture is a continuous stream of architectural decisions. And that means that you have to reason about what's going to happen in the future, anticipate. Um, and then, of course, you can do that in, uh, in a number of ways. Uh, this is the agile traditional way. You first build all the green stuff. Um, and then, of course, in the second iteration, you, uh, you may have to uh, add a little bit of architecture because it tends to break down all the time. And you may have to fix some defects, but uh, still you're prioritizing by business value. And uh, in the end, you have to do some quite a bit of refactoring, uh, getting rid of the technical debt. And in the end, then, um, uh, uh, of course, the, the, in the end, you may actually end up with uh, some remaining technical debt, but you don't care because the system works. The, be, because you actually don't think up 
uh, think upfront that much. You may have to, it may have become a little bit more expensive, especially if the situation is stable. So your cost actually is a little bit more than uh, if you don't have to do all this black stuff. And, uh, but it is fully in line with agile uh, philosophy, and especially in volatile environments where the things change all the time. Uh, uh, this is a good strategy because you don't build unnecessary yellow stuff. You don't build unnecessary uh, architecture uh, elements. Um, this is the other uh, uh, extreme, uh, where uh, you actually start by building a huge architecture framework, and um, uh, maybe one little user story, something like Hello World. And uh, uh, then uh, once you have satisfied that the architecture is there, you may carefully start to build some more functionality. This is, uh, this is the plan-driven philosophy. Of course, here, um, the risk is that uh, by this time, a lot of money has already been spent, and your business users haven't seen any definite result yet, so they may actually cancel the project. So that's a real risk, especially in volatile environments. This may be a very risky strategy. But if you are building a very complex solution or one that is very business critical, this is actually uh, uh, makes sense. And of course, in the real world, there's no such thing as extremes. Extreme is always bad. You know, we don't like the extremists on the left or on the right. But we always have to reason about it, and we have to find the middle, road, middle ground. And we do that by economic reasoning. So to summarize, some lessons learned from our experience at ProRail, uh, uh, teach architects about decisions and about economic reasoning actually makes them more agile, uh, and it makes, it makes it easier for them to, uh, to uh, connect with the agile uh, delivery teams. And using the time dimension actually to reason about architecture is really uh, important as well, especially if you have a lot of dependencies. That was it. Any questions? We have a lovely assistant with a microphone, so <laughs> who wants to do the first question? Not everyone at once. There's one, all the way in the back. Uh, was wondering, you, you present a situation where uh, architecture is working in line with one HR project. Um, in practice, at least, where I'm come from, I tend to see that there's uh, several developments happening in parallel over several projects, sharing an architecture board or a group of architects. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a bit about how you see this working in your system? Right, so y you're right, this is a simplified uh, uh, picture. And, and very often uh, this process <laughs> takes place at a higher hierarchical level as well as at the, at the, at the, uh, the single team uh, level. So yeah, an architect has to be able to jump between those uh, hierarchical levels. And sometimes there's just two, sometimes there's three, sometimes the project architect is, uh, 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 you know, is, uh, has above him some kind of a, a domain architect, and above that domain architect there's a business architect, etc. So there may be very many layers or hierarchies of architecture. And um, yeah, so then you need to figure out how do we do this? We, we, do you build, first of all for the teams, do you build feature teams or uh, that, that can actually touch all of the code, or actually, uh, or do you build component teams that uh, are experts on, on, on one piece of the, of, the, of the solution? And then with the architects, the same thing. Um, my advice there is always to actually cross-connect those. If you have feature teams, then the architect should be specialist on one structural area. And if, but if you have component teams, then the architects actually should be the ones that are able to connect those uh, and, and have, the whole, have the whole picture. So architects are about bringing context to the Agile delivery team. More questions? You had one. You were talking about technical depth. Um, I was wondering if you, have a, if you identify a piece of technical depth, um, you can't always just you know, repair everything and make every, everything pretty. But it's not always obvious up front which piece is gonna, you know, come back and, you know, cause problems for you in a, you know, at a later point. So how do, you, um, how do you decide which one gets to stay in there and remain in place and which one needs immediate looking after? Like how do you right. get... 
So in a changing environment, that's very hard to anticipate, and so it's better to actually wait until the technical debt really starts, uh, starts to cost you. <laughs> All right, so basically... And if, but if you are every, actually in an, in an environment where you can actually anticipate some stuff, like, okay, we know that this user is very likely to ask next month for this kind of functionality, and we need to really get... We cannot build it with this technical debt in. So the answer basically is that you need to reason about it and not have a dogma like saying, uh, you know, some architects say, we, uh, we should get rid of all technical debt. Actually, I, I attended a talk once uh, that was called uh, uh, Zero Technical Debt Software Development. And I think it, it's, uh, you know, even if you are able to do it, it's not a good idea because very often uh, getting some technical debt consciously, making an architectural decision to make a shortcut somewhere, it's a very good idea to make a deadline uh, or, uh, you know, maybe the, the, the debt is less harmful than actually doing following the full architecture. But you need to reason about it. If you, if you are dogmatic about it, then you are likely to, to, to make a, a wrong decision. But if you are reasoning, if you, and if you can connect it to economic arguments, such as risks, don't forget the risks, you know, the cost of the technical debt refactoring is always quite clear. Oh, it will take us a week to do that. But the risk of not doing it actually is much, much more important. And it's, it's usually, uh, or very often, uh, it can actually break down the whole system if you don't repair it. So basically, perhaps the, um, the difference between like regular code and technical debt isn't that black and white? No. All right. Thank no. you. <laughs> well, unless you are just talking about uh, uh, code technical debt, like uh, the ones that can be measured, for example, by, by sonar or something like that. I'm talking about architectural technical debt, which is actually more structural in nature and is about, for example, temporarily violating some architecture rules about things that layers can do between each other or stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, that's it for the time. So one more thank you for LGO.